How's that? Better? Perfect. Okay, my presenter view then is on this screen, so I apologize if it looks like I'm ignoring all of you. Uh, so we're going to talk about neurogenic bladder, vejiga neurogena, or also known as neurogenica, depending on you know what country you're in, basically. But um, both words work. Vejiga is bladder. Neurogena is neurogenic. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about. We're specifically in spinal cord injury uh, is what we're going to discuss. So um, I um, have mixed Spanish kind of throughout. I haven't done one of these lectures for you all before. So it's kind of just interspersed. It's not, not every slide will have it. Some slides will have more than others. Some slides will be only Spanish. So we'll see how it goes. Um, but basically we're going to try and, and what I really want you to get out of this lecture is to learn about neurogenic bladder and maybe one or two Spanish words if you get them. All right. So it, this is some English vocabulary. Uh, detrusor is the muscle of the bladder wall. So when you hear detrusor, it's basically the same as saying bladder. A, and um, urination, micturition, voiding all mean the same thing. So uh, let's go. Now we have a little bit of Spanish vocabulary. Mixion is micturition or voiding. Centro, miccional, pontino. Right, so you can kind of get so centro, center, miccional is micturition again, like, but it's not the same as the micturition above miccional as like the type referring to like in the realm of micturition and pontino is pine, is pon, pons, pontine. Uh, medulla espinal is the spinal cord itself. Uh, esfinter, sphincter. Uh, the trusor, the trusor, vejiga, we talked about the bladder already. So there's some, you know, these aren't necessarily things that will be on every slide, but just some vocabulary that I thought I'd throw out there before I forgot to ever do it. Um, so um, I'm happy to go through pronunciations if that's helpful for anyone, if anybody has questions about how to use any of these in a sentence or what any of these things are. Like, does everybody know what the pontine micturition center is or what the spinal cord is? There's no silly questions here. Okay. I can't say I've heard a lot about the pontine micturition center. Um, yeah. The spinal cord is a different story, but yeah. um, I guess. I would, yeah, I would hope if you're above first year med school, condition. you should know. MS2 and above should know what a spinal cord is. Um, so uh, the pontine micturition, so there's three main centers of uh, micturition within or, or urination, mixion within your body. One is your brain, cerebro, or in the specifically like more frontal cortex. And its job is to tell you always not to pee. So constantly it's saying, don't pee, don't pee, don't pee, don't pee, don't pee, don't pee. And it's the part of your brain that will relax when you get to the end of a flight and 20 minutes ago, you didn't have to pee at all. And now you feel like you're going to pee in front of everybody in your pants. So that's what that controls. The pontine micturition center, centro miccional pontino, is controls um, the act of the signals going correctly to your bladder to have the bladder contract and the esfinter relax. Okay. So vejiga contract, esfinter relax. And so the pons is what controls that. If the pons is out, that control is messed up and you might, both things might contract at the same time or one thing might contract while the other is not uh, relaxing, you know, it just may not work correctly. And then the last kind of part of your micturition control is actually, you know, the, the signals going down the spinal cord and actually reaching the parts that they should. Cool make sense at a high level great all right so ideally when you should be able to hold a large amount of volume in your bladder right you don't want to have to pee every five minutes you should be continent so that you're not leaking everywhere you should pee when you want to pee and you should not hurt your kidneys so what can happen is if your bladder pressures build up too high you can have kidney damage so this would be for anyone this is ideal bladder function Relatively speaking, this isn't stuff you have to memorize. Uh, and you see the bottom there, la capacidad normal de la vejiga, the normal capacity of the bladder is son 400 a 
500 mililitros. So, capacidad, capacity, vejiga, bladder. Uh, your patients, depending on their um, level of education, may or may not you know, understand how much four or 500 milliliters is in English or Spanish, but that's, um, you should. So that's about a normal bladder capacity. That's about when your bladder tells you you have to pee. All of us have been on rounds or in a test and peed way more than that. So certainly it's not the maximum capacity, but that's usually when you're really feeling like you have to pee. Uh, I won't go through each of these individual things. This is being recorded and you can read things yourself as well as I can to you. Uh, but you should also know that you make about a cc of urine a minute, so about 60 an hour. And that should give you a sense for if you have a patient and the nurse is like, oh, they're peeing. You know, I put a condom catheter on them. Well, how much did they pee today? Well, they peed like 300 cc's. Automatically, you should be worried because either they're mad dehydrated or they're retaining because they're making a lot more urine, but it's not all coming out. And the nurse thinks they're peeing, but they're really not emptying all the way. So that's how you use that clinically. How much Does that make sense? Okay. If I'm going too fast, you let me know. I'm going a little bit fast because we have like 50 slides or so. Uh, so you see here, this I did word for word translations from top to bottom. So this is normal bladder emptying without a spinal cord injury. So you have el esfínter, right? The, the sphincter. There are two sphincters voluntary uh, uh, and an involuntary sphincter. So right, internal, external, right? So the external sphincter is voluntarily controlled and the internal sphincter is not. So esfínter externo, external sphincter, esfínter interno, internal sphincter. All of you are just gonna remember esfínter at the end of this. But that you can use that in a lot of different settings. So it's a good one. Relajación is relaxation, right? So that can come in handy uh, for in a lot of in a lot of different exams. Like uh, you tell somebody, relaje el brazo, relax your arm, right? Relajar is a good word just to kind of have because a lot of people after stroke and stuff or in general have trouble relaxing when you're examining them. Contracción, contraction of the bladder, and flujo, which is just flow. Orina is urine. Right, so if you're asking a question specifically about urine, ¿qué color es su orina? What color is your urine? ¿Huele mal su orina? Does your urine smell bad? Right, but you can also just say orina and go like this. Right, so you can use a little, you know, like people, you know, you get by. So you have some 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 words here and there. So bladder filling and emptying. So this is again just kind of like what we just went through the other with a little more. I don't expect you all to memorize all these words, but basically what this says is there's a filling phase of the bladder, right? Sympathetic is store and parasympathetic is pee, right? This is the op, kind of like there's store and pee, point and shoot. So it's parasympathetic, sympathetic. Y'all remember, you've all heard that, that's not new. Okay, so when la fase de, de, llena, de llenado or um, like the filling phase is basically one where the bladder has to relax and allow for the filling and the sphincter has to hold tight. And that's what gives you, um, makes you continent, right? So esfínter, in this case, they're saying, you know, I put urethra, uh, uretra, just to give you another vocabulary word. So uretra cerrada, so closed uh, uh, urethra, um, or esfínter, right, cerrado. And the vejiga relajada, right? That's another way to say relaxed. Continencia is continence. Uh, and then uh, fase de evacuación or fase de mixión, right? So evacuation or peeing. And so your parasympathetics are activated and la vejiga contrae, it contracts, right? And uh, la uretra se abre, the ureter opens and you pee. Got it. How am I doing, Caitlin? Is this like a normal lecture where you talk, people go through like this or do I need to focus more on words? No, no, this is great. Everybody okay. does it this way. Okay, great. Okay. Oh, this is a busy slide. I don't love these kinds of slides, but it's kind of um, to some degree necessary. We talked about this some, thankfully, thanks to Jen's question. So we have the voluntary control at the brain level, the pontine coordination, 
and then everything that comes below that. So the parasympathetics live in the lumbar spine. I mean, sorry, the sympathetics live in the lumbar spine. Those are the nerves that will store the urine, right? So they do things that, right? They send a signal to the bladder to relax. They send a signal to the sphincter to contract, right? Things that will store. Then you have sacral parasympathetics. They cause you to pee. So they cause the bladder to contract, the sphincter to relax. And then you have your sacral somatics, meaning uh, where you have voluntary muscle control, that would be the external sphincter. So that's like if, you're, if your frontal cortex relax says, okay, you can pee. And the pond is like, all right, go, you know, have at it, sacral parasympathetics. And uh, your sacral somatic or external sphincter control is your last line of defense where like a little, a little may come out, but you'll make it to the bathroom in time. Make sense? Okay. All right, so we're gonna talk about different lesions and, and how they actually present. So you can have a lesion uh, basically above the pons. The blue line is the pons, right? So let's say you have a lesion in the brain. The pons is still there, right? So the pons can control the normal uh, contraction, relaxation of the bladder with what needs to happen uh, with the sphincter, right? So basically what you get is incontinence. So you could pee at any old time, but at least you're emptying all the way. Um, if you get a lesion at the level of the pons or like below the level of the pons, but within the spinal cord itself, right? So you, so like above the conus medullaris or above the cauda equina, then what you get is that discoordination we were talking about where the pons can't control anything. The bladder still has to, it's still going to try and pee. You get hyperreflexia. Um, and so what happens is all the muscles everywhere in your body are probably like jumping and spazzing all over. And your bladder's no different. It's constantly trying to, to contract. And your sphincter's no different. Internal sphincter contracting, external sphincter contracting. So what you get is this weird interplay where depending on exactly your pattern of spasm, you might be able to pee, you might not, but there's going to be times where this detrusor and the sphincter contract at the same time, which is not supposed to happen, which we call dyssynergia to sound fancy, right? Either of these two things, the incontinence or the dis, so the dyssynergia, anybody that has a lesion between the pons, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, and this green line, so between the blue and the green line, is going to have dyssynergia, regardless of whether they're emptying their bladder fully or not. That just means they got lucky and the form of dyssynergia that they have allows them to empty. But they're all going to have dyssynergia, no matter what. Uh, so these are both upper motor neuron bladders. So vejiga neurogenica espastica, so spastic bladder. And then we have lower motor neuron type bladder, which is an injury at the level of the cauda equina or below, which basically is flaccid, flaccida. Um, and so you have no, you know, the bladder is just totally flaccid. The sphincters are open. You would think that person might link, might leak constantly, but the truth is they don't really leak till the bladder gets full. And even then they just leak a little bit, but the bladder doesn't empty because it doesn't contract. So what ends up happening is you have these bladders that are full of urine, four or 500, 600 cc's. They leak a little when they reach like a liter. So you go from like 500 cc's or let's say 800 cc's to 500 cc's to 800 cc's to 500 cc's and everybody thinks you're peeing fine but the truth is you're very slowly getting a really bad uti <laughs> um so if somebody on your exam is spastic if they have a lot of hyperreflexia you can expect one of the two bladders on top that he gets spastica or if on exam right rectal exam, whatever else you'd be doing on your Asia exam. But if basically, if the legs are all loose and floppy, you're probably dealing with uh, a flaccid, vejiga flaccida. Cool. And we, we have to know the difference because we manage them different ways. Okay. So this is basically the same thing that we just talked about in a different way. So if the lesion is below the pons or at the pons and knocks it out, we have no pons. What happens is the bladder starts to fill. It's sending up signals like, can I pee? Can I pee? Can I pee? It doesn't hear anything back. 
So then the reflex arc just takes over. And when it feels the stretch, it squeezes, right? At first, that stretch is going to be feel, not felt till like five, four or 500 cc's. Over time, though, as the muscle becomes more spastic, you'll start to feel that stretch. Well, you won't feel it, but the bladder will at 100, 200 cc's. So you'll start to get constant attempts to pee. And that sphincter also will, you know, will try to close against those, um, against the bladder contractions. So this is the dysenergia that you would see. Um, right, this is all the same stuff we've kind of talked about already, but I'll leave it up. I have, we have it in a few different ways, just in case people learn differently. Okay. If the detrusor or bladder, right, the trusor mejiga, contraction, contraction, is stronger than the sphincter, then the urine will come out. If the sphincter, esphincter, is stronger, es más poderoso, than the bladder, más fuerte, más poderoso, um, that's stronger, then the urine will not come out. This is a very simple concept, but very important, right? And the reason it's important is because in either case, uh, what we don't know without certain testing is how high the pressure is getting in the bladder. Certainly the lower one is worse because you can imagine that the blood, the pressure would just be building and building and building. When the pressure builds to a certain amount, that can cause hydronephrosis and kidney damage. On the top one, it's hard to know, you know, is if the bladder is defeating the sphincter at a safe pressure or not till it has to build up such strong pressure that the kidneys will feel it. So this is the crux of bladder management. Otherwise we really wouldn't care, you know, but before, I think it was World War II or one, I can't remember. Before that, the leading cause of death and spinal cord injury was um, kidney failure. Cause nobody really understood how this, how this interplay affected the, the kidneys. Okay. Over time, what happens with Vejiga neurogenica espástica, upper motor neuron spastic bladder, is that we said the stretch reflex starts to happen sooner. The muscles become hypertrophied. If you ever watch The Simpsons, there's one episode where like Homer just lifts weights with like one arm and that one arm becomes like enormous and the other arm is all wimpy and he wins like an arm wrestling championship or something. So what happened? the same thing happening with the bladder. So what you see is the shape of the bladder when you fill it with contrast, looks like a Christmas tree or like a cone. What you don't see is the whole bladder wall around here, which is hypertrophied. You kind of see instances of that. They call it Christmas tree because it even looks like it has a little ornaments around it. Um, that's And so then what happens is the bladder becomes stiff and you, it doesn't fit as much. And ultimately, like it only ends up holding like very little urine. Bonus points on this picture. Anybody see anything besides a Christmas tree bladder? Is there a missing ureter? Uh, well, I don't know if it's missing as much as this one, because you really don't want contrast going up to the ureters at all. Right. So what you're seeing is some kind of issue here where you're getting hydronephrosis, probably some re some kind of flow back up into the into the ureters, or hydro, I guess hydro ureter. You know, you can kind of start to make out the kidney here. So that's what you see here. So yeah, technically, you were correct, but I would just phrase it differently. All right, this is another example of a nice thick walled bladder. Okay, so uh, so here's the ureter, ureter, right? Dilated ureter. And the way that the kidneys and the, like the ureters work into the bladder it, is it's like, a, it's like a nice calm stream, a stream that you would meditate next to, right? That's the flow. It's a low pressure system. So a lot of times we think that the what happens is there's like retrograde flow or um, reflux back into the ureters from the bladder, but that's actually not the case. What happens is when the pressure builds too high in the bladder, it obstructs the flow from the ureter. So it's like putting a dam there. And that's what causes the hydro ureter and ultimately the hydronephrosis. Okay, so kidney is riñón. Uh, hydronephrosis, hydronephrosis, and renal failure, 
insufficiencia or insufficiency renal. So here, this is the hydronephrosis. All this is dark stuff is, is contrast or water, urine. That's not how your kidney should look. All this would be relatively small, should be small relative to the, the calyces should be small relative to the kidney. But in this case, they're gigantic. So this is a complication of, um, of uh, untreated, right? Or poorly treated upper motor neuron bladder. Right. So then this kind of person could go on dialysis, they could get full fulminant renal failure and go on dialysis. Okay, so how do we know? How do we know? How do we diagnose? The same way we diagnose anything else. Historia clinica, clinical like uh, HPI, right? Examen físico, physical exam. And then we can do labs and testing. Hemograma, so like just blood work. Examen general de orina, urine, right? There's that word again. So you can do a urinalysis or different urine test. And you can do other studies. Radiografía del aparato urinario of the urinary system. Aparato is like, it can kind of mean like any machinery, basically. But in this case, it's like urinary symptom system. Aparato urinario. Radiografía is x-ray. And you can get uh, estudios urodinámicos. So that's a urodynamic study, which I think I have slides on later. But basically, all this should really be clinical history and physical exam. So I should know, based on my exam, and the history, the presentation of the patient, historia clínica, e examen físico, um, if they have an upper motor neuron or lower motor neuron bladder. And then that drives what I do next in terms of what I need to do. So like somebody has, you know, I have to have a reason why I'm getting blood work. Am I worried that they might have hydronephrosis? So I'm going to check the creatinine and kidney function, right? Or am I worried that they could have a UTI? That's why I'm checking the urine. Uh, why would I get an x-ray? Right? Why would I get a urodynamic study? So those are the questions to answer. Uh, but there's some fun vocabulary for you. Okay. Uh, yeah, the next one we'll talk about urodynamic. So physical exam, what are the things we might do? If you're not sure if somebody has an upper motor neuron bladder, most of the time you can tell, especially if the lesion is like cervical spine or thoracic. But if you're not sure or you want to be wholly complete, right, or you're a resident on service and your attending is going to ask you for that full ASIA exam, you're going to find signs of hyperreflexia on your exam of the um, anus, basically. Why do we have to do this exam? What's, why can't we just... Examine the legs, call it a day. Anybody? I mean, I think on the age exam, it's super important um, for sacral sparing. So I think um, this is part of that um, assessment. That is correct, 100%, but it's not the exact read my mind answer that I wanted. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I, you know, the way I'd explain it to a patient, because if a patient says to you, why the heck are you doing that? Why don't you just test my toes? You know, does my legs and my toes. This oh. is, right? Doesn't it have impact for prognosis? Yeah, but I mean, I mean, yes and no, but sticking your finger in somebody's butt has no impact on prognosis. So make sure the patient is out of spine. So here's what I would say to a patient, right? So you're, you all are trying to answer the question as if I were me. And nobody has said anything incorrect per se, but those aren't necessarily answers that, that a patient would want to hear. And like in spinal shock, you'd have an idea, right? If their legs are spastic, then they would be out of spinal shock, presumably as long as the lesion was above um, like a lumbar area. The truth is, right? If you remember when we were little nematodes, uh, you know, like early phase or like blastocysts, whatever, we become nematodes, like a little straight line in embryology right? All of our myotomes and dermatomes are in a straight line down. It's not till we get little arm buds and leg buds that everything gets rearranged. And where our personal areas were, it gets moved. But in actuality, if you remember our nematode selves, the lowest parts of the spinal cord innervate your personal areas. 
So there's no way for me to know if the signal's getting all the way through to the end of your spinal cord without testing down below. So that's the answer I give patients because they always ask, well, why don't, well, I say, well, I don't know if the signal's getting all the way through, right? Because I just had, this actually just happened right before this. We were, I was doing an Asia exam with one of the PGY2s and the patient was like, why are you doing that? Test my toes. <laughs> it happened right before this. Um, and he actually asked the question, well, why am I numb in my personal area if my legs aren't numb? Which is the same kind of idea, right? So that's why from a patient's perspective, it's important to do this exam. From a clinical perspective, you're all correct, depending on the phase and time of injury, depending on what we're looking for and how we manage the bladder. Is it possible that the legs are spastic and the bladder and bowel are flaccid? Sure, it's possible. It might be unlikely depending on the lesion, but it's possible. So we test. And if you find hyperreflexia, then you know it's an upper motor neuron bladder and you know how to manage it. So that makes sense? All right. All right, so two things to kind of understand the tests that you might do. We're not going to get in like way, way deep on management. This is an intro lecture. But there are two studies you should know what they are. Uh, one is a post void residual, which is the amount of urine left in the bladder after you pee. The way that we normally do that is have a patient pee or catch when they urinate, and then you just put an ultrasound machine over their bladder and calculates how much is left. Uh, that's important just to know how much people are retaining. Um, if they're retaining more than an amount that you're okay with, then you might have to catheterize them for purposes of pressure management, or in the case, especially in the case of like a lower motor neuron bladder, avoidance of like fluorid urinary tract infection. A urodynamic study is a little bit different. You can see that on the lower right, you have all these wires going in everywhere, but basically it, it measures pressure. So you have a wire and catheter in the rectum, you have wires and catheters that go up the urethra and into the bladder. You fill the bladder fully and you watch the pressures and see what they do. You fill it until they pee. So then you can measure how high the pressures actually get and if they're safe or not. You measure the pressure in the bladder and the pressure in the rectum because the rectum approximates the pressure in the rest of the abdomen, like if somebody's valsavaing or, or bearing down. So you subtract, the subtraction of the two gives you the true pressure within the bladder. Uh, that's a little bit of a technicality, but the basic here is this is what tells you what the pressures are. So without this, you can never be sure uh, what the pressures are. If you've got somebody that's been living in the community for 30 years, they've been just peeing all, any old time, they have an upper neuro, motor neuron bladder, vejiga neurogenica espastica, based on your exam, and you do a creatinine and the creatinine's fine, you probably don't have to rush and do a urodynamics because... They've been living for this 30 years and their kidneys are fine. This is usually something that's done early on or if somebody's bladder status or physical exam changes. Right? If, gosh, I was never leaking before, but I am now, right? Or all of a sudden I can move my legs where I couldn't or vice versa. Right? Some doctors will do urodynamics like every year. I don't know that you really need to, but you should always have a reason why you're doing a test, not just to like do it. But uh, there are different ways to, I guess, different ways to skin a cat, to use an outdated uh, expression. Okay, so how do we manage upper motor neuron bladder? There's catheterization, catheterismo. This is preferred if a person's not emptying all the way and they can do it themselves, right? If somebody has no arms, catheterismo is probably not the right thing to do, right? So in that case, if somebody can't catheterize themselves, you might have to use an indwelling catheter. So a Foley or transurethral, transuretral, catheter, or suprapubic, catheter suprapubico. And then, so that's a catheter that goes in like in through the like, kind of like the mons pubis area. So those are indwelling catheters that stay a long time. If you think somebody's going to need a long-term catheter, suprapubic is usually the way I go because it doesn't interfere with intimate relations the way a transurethral does. Uh, bladder reflex triggering. So this is a balanced bladder. This basically is like, if you can get someone, even though they have no control, if you can get the detrusor sphincter dyssynergia, maybe with some help of medications just right, 
so that they're actually emptying their bladder fully or enough that it's safe, even if they're, you're basically making them incontinent. And then you can just put a condom catheter on them and let them go on their way. You can also sometimes trigger, have a patient trigger the bladder reflex by tapping. There's some maneuvers we'll go over. Um, I have the Spanish names for them for them a little later as well. Does this make sense so far? Uh, how common is it for urinary concerns to progress over time with an SCI? It's common, uh, meaning it's not everyone, but it's not unusual that things will change with time. Because imagine if you didn't have a spinal cord injury, your urination is going to change with time anyway, depending on uh, if your prostate gets big or uh, you have eight kids or whatever else happens in your life. So things change with time. So you have to always be um, cognizant of that and ask. Things can change just from cathing over and over. You might get a stricture in the, in the urethra or like scarring. That can change things. So, all right, this is a little bit of a busy slide, but just to give you an idea, basically over time, more people as they get older, 30 years out from spinal cord injury, tend to prefer or lean or have an indwelling catheter. I don't actually know, you know, this is just a slide in and of itself. You see it, we, a lot of people seem to have either been lost to follow up or passed away. But you can see at first, most people are doing it intermittent cath. So if, even if we though go break down by like percent, right? By percent, slowly becomes more indwelling. So take that for what it's worth. Um, maybe people get arthritis in their hands over time. Maybe they gain a lot of weight and they can't see or reach, um, or something else happens. They get lazy. So um, external catheterization. So let's say our goal for someone. Say they have high level tetraplegia, they cannot move their hands, so they cannot catheterize. We want to try and avoid a Foley if we can, because it's, you know, that increases the risk of bladder cancer, it increases the risk of infection. So we want to, we, our goal will be incontinence, which sometimes is called balanced bladder or reflex voiding. So it's hard in a woman to do that unless you're okay having them be wet in a diaper. Uh, so a lot of the discussion is usually around men. So A, whether or not a condom catheter will fit or stay on is important. Uh, B, you want to make sure that the post-void residuals or the amount of urine that's in the bladder at any given time is 200 or less. That's relatively like 9 out of 10 times going to be safe bladder pressures. But when you get the chance, you do the urodynamics, and as long as the bladder pressure is under 40, when they're reflex voiding or when they start to pee, then you're okay. And dysreflexia, which, you know, I, I think it's fine. Like if you have really bad dysreflexia that is con like persistent throughout because you're of your bladder, that's a problem. But if it's like when you go pee, it's like 10 seconds of dysreflexia is probably not a problem. So there's some practical um, way that you apply your knowledge there. Um, am I losing anyone? Are we good? I know we've had a few slides without Spanish, but there'll be Spanish coming up again. Good? Okay. So external catheter management. So if, what do we do? Like if somebody's retaining a little too much, but we want them to pee, want them to pee more. So you might use medication to relax the sphincter, right? Esfincter. <laughs> Relajar el esfínter. So you can use the different medicines, uh, like Flomax is an example of an alpha adrenergic uh, anti-alpha medication. And you can use that. You can relax the sphincter, and hopefully that will allow that bladder to contract without the sphincter in the way. And hopefully then you can get under into safe pressures or into safe amounts of urinary retention. And so we do different things. Sometimes people have surgeries, sphincterotomies, different things to achieve this too. Uh, goal. So whose goal might be somebody to actually have an indwelling catheter? Um, so people that you can't quite figure out, like they have high, you can't, like the Flomax doesn't work or um, you can't quite figure, like you can't get them to just do intermittent cath. They're constantly leaking in between. You can't keep them dry. 
um, maybe women with high tetraplegia and they don't want to be wet on a diaper all the time. So those would be people that you put an indwelling catheter in. People that are like, have a really high like BMI and they're apple shaped, they can't reach. Um, sometimes you might need an indwelling catheter. Um, so also like if you, if you're a woman, you might be more likely to get a super pubic because it's easier to manage, right? Imagine like your home care nurse or attendant, like a penis is kind of easier to get to and like change out a catheter than a urethra in a woman. Like sometimes it's like, depending on the anatomy, size of the person, it's not easy to get to. So that super pubic can just be easy to change and exchange. Um, so that's sometimes something you consider depending on the person. Um, so, uh, that, so we can say like tetraplegia, so it's the same, just pronounced differently, tetraplegia, paraplegia. Um, who can perform intermittent cath? People that have hands and need it, right? You know, e even people sometimes with very low tetraplegia that have a little bit of finger but not full finger control can get this done. The consideration here is though, can you do it in a chair? If you can't do it in a chair, right? You see this person in the chair at the bottom left, like they had to pull their pants in on their own. They had to adjust their body on their own and they have to like angle the thing into the toilet or into a bag. And then they have to be able to pull their pants up. So from a practical perspective, you really have to have paraplegia if you want to do intermittent cath and live your life on your own without needing like a home attendant or having to get back in bed to perform the catheterization. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, it's, I mean, what's the goal? If somebody's catheterizing, I mean, the, the take home really here should be what goes in must come out, right? So if you go to the movies and you have a giant soda, you're going to pee an extra one or two times. So the same is true for somebody with has a spinal cord injury. So depending on how much they drink, you might have to do more cathing. If you don't want to cath more than four times a day, then don't drink more than like a liter and a half to two liters. And, you know, limit the caffeine. Questions so far? Cateterismo, that's catheterizations. Okay, so I promise there's a little bit of Spanish coming up again, but I just want to, like, these are important slides. So I just want to make sure that we hit them and like really got the knowledge. So, but if they're still leaking between catheterizations, so we want someone to be catheterizing. And so we don't want them to leak in between because what's the point of catheterizing? You have paraplegia, you want to catheterize. What's the point of catheterizing if you're just going to be wet in between? Right, so there are two types of meds we can use. Anticholinergic, right? That would be something like a ditropan, also known as oxybutynin. Or beta agonists, that's uh, mirabegbron, also known as mirabetric. They each have side effects. Anticholinergic meds can dehydrate you, can make your poop hard, can have cognitive side effects. Uh, beta uh, agonists can increase your blood pressure and your heart rate. So this would be things to consider, but generally well tolerated and uh, might help you, might help that bladder relax. This is the opposite, right? We want this for the detrusor sphincter dysinergia. In this case, we want the sphincter to win. Queremos que gane win el esfínter. So we want it to stay cerrado, shut. And so we give the, the bladder meds to relax. Cool? Okay. How else can we get the bladder to relax? So, podemos inyectar, we can inject it, con toxina botulinica. So, botulinum toxin, you can use Botox into the bladder. That will relax, you don't get the side effects of the other meds, but it is a lot, all those black dots you see are injection points. <laughs> it's a lot of injections into the bladder. So we have had patients get like dysreflexic while they're getting the the uh, injections. I've had some of the urologists will actually like kind of wash out with a lidocaine, like a liquid lidocaine. So people are a little bit numb when they do it. Um, they're all surgeries you can do. You can take part of the colon and like make the bladder bigger. These are gigantic surgeries. Uh, I would never do them unless if there's like no other option. They have, when they go well, they go well. But I've had several like, people I inherited that have had a lot of 
I mean, it's like, it's like a gastric bypass or like, you know, you're like cutting part of the intestine out, reanastomosing it, and then like cutting the bladder open and reanastomosing it with intestine. There's a lot that can go wrong. And when it does go wrong, it's not pretty. When it works, it works great though. Okay. okay. So um, we'll just quickly run through this. The appropriate bladder management for different levels of spinal cord injury. So vejiga bladder, right? Como manejamos? How do we manage? How do we drive? La vejiga. Uh, so who, who gets an indwelling catheter? Very high people with very high level tetraplegia, if they're not a candidate for a condom catheter, right? Because that means the people that have no hand function, assuming you can't get them to leak fully on their own. Who can start to catheterize? Uh, people that are start to have more hand function. Again, we have to think about this in the context of what is actually practical in somebody's life. And here you see what's called a metrophenoff, which is a bladder augmentation. And then they take the appendix and that's the bottom picture here. They take the appendix and like put it against the, usually they hide it in like the belly button with a continent stoma and you can catheterize through that. That might be a way around, but again, that's a big surgery. Uh, it's not little. Uh, for men, you can start to use different tools to intermittently catheterize kind of at relatively high levels. But again, how practical is this? You have to be set up the whole time. This is really for someone whose like partner or home attendant refuses to catheterize them, but doesn't mind setting them up. Like I'll pull down your pants. This little thing here holds the penis in place. I'll put that over your penis and then you catheterize. But like you, there's no way somebody could set this up in like a public bathroom, right? Um, and there are other things like these, this is a spring-loaded labia spreader. Again, not necessarily like practical for everyday life, but it could allow someone to self-cath even if they only want to do it when they are in bed at home, let's say. Because if you think about it, right, depending on your anatomy, if you're a woman, you might have to, you have to spread, you have to get in the right position, you have to spread the labia. And so that takes two hands, you got to like, and then you have to like finesse with the catheter. If you're, if you're a man and you can get the penis to stay still, you can use two hands like this, hold the catheter and just pull it back. You don't have the luxury of doing that. If you're a woman, even the labia spreader is not perfect. It's just like, there's not a lot of room and stuff, but it exists. And intermittent cath, people that have now hand and finger function. Okay. Now let's talk about mejiga flaccida. Mejiga neurogenica flaccida. It's flaccid bladder. So again, this is a bladder that has no reflexes. Generally, you're just this is just like intermittent catheterization. You can sometimes use an indwelling catheter, but you run the risk because the sphincter, el esfínter, is so relajado, so relaxed, that you can get leakage around the Foley, or if you have a suprapubic, you can still get leakage through the urethra. So a lot of times the answer here is intermittent cath, even if you're not leaking, before you leak. So maybe every four to six hours, even though you could go longer. All right, sometimes you can build up the urethra with um, some injections to like bulk it, things like that, that are more permanent. Um, it's kind of, this is just an, remember the, where the anatomy is, what would lead to a lower motor neuron bladder. It's cauda equina, potentially conus, depending on the injury there. Um, okay. We talked, we've talked about this a little ad nauseum, right? So, um, if the bladder fills enough, you're still going to look like you're incontinent, but the truth is you're retaining a lot. If you turn, if you have Valsalva or whatever, you'll have a little leakage, but it may not be enough to fully empty. That's just super important because I have had patients arrive where the nurse has been told the person is peeing, is they're incontinent. We bladder scan them and there's a leader in there. And we catheterize them for the worst smelling urine you've ever smelled in your life. So it's important to kind of have that index of suspicion when you take your physical exam, examen físico, clinical history, Historia clinica, and you adapt that to what you're seeing in front of you. All right, so areflexia, all these things we kind of talked about. 
and should should not be necessarily new, but signs that are lower motor neuron bladder are signs that you're areflexic. Sometimes you might even feel the bladder, like in a case I just the case I just shared with you. High posterior residual, that's what we're talking about. Well, how do you get a lower motor neuron bladder to empty? You can strain, that's called a valsalva. Maneuver is maniobra de valsalva. Or you can do a crede, which is tapping on the like mons pubis area or 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 kind of pushing there. That's called maniobra de crede. Uh, you can intermittent catheterization. You can do intermittent catheterization, catheterismo. Or you can use an indwelling catheter, catheter, um, and then depending on if you want suprapubic or transurethral. Did I lose anybody? I feel like I started going fast. No. I just kind of keep an eye on the clock. Um, so goals for lower motor neuron bladder, we just want to keep the bladder empty. We want to be continent in between. Same goals as with upper motor neuron. Uh, what else can we do? You can have like this continent cuff sphincter. It's the mechanism is the same as like what some men get for a uh, erectile dysfunction, but instead it's this is just um, tightens around the urethra. This has fallen super out of favor because over time the urethras were just like um, kind of dying, <laughs> and so they would break apart, and then you would have no urethra, and you were in a worse worse place for sure. So. Um, let me just skip a couple of these, I think. Let's go here. So for women, there are different procedures you can do. I hinted at the urethral bulking, right? If you need that for catheterizing and somebody's leaking too much, or you can do what's called a sling procedure, which is actually common in, in women in general um, if they have uh, incontinence later in life. We talked about this. Okay, let's go here. This is an important slide. So there are risks to different um, um, man like different ways that you manage bladder. UTI, the lowest risk is actually an uh, intermittent cath. I mean, if somebody's external to cath and they're actually emptying, like it depends. The external cath can can cause UTI when you like there's always like urine there. I mean, so you've seen patients, there's like, you see the cath and there's like just urine like all around the penis. Uh, but if you keep it clean and somebody's sitting up and there's not much there, then external cath can be better than inter intermittent cath. Then then you have the indwelling. So indwelling is the worst, doesn't matter which kind. Urethral erosions, again, indwelling is the worst. Obviously, a suprapubic and these other things won't cause urethral erosions. Um, bladder cancer. Indwelling catheter again, and bladder stones, indwelling catheter. So you see there's a lot of risks to indwelling catheters relative to the other things. So when we can, we try it and avoid the indwelling catheters. Um, it's just a cool little slide to have so you can see, so like, what do you do when? Um, and when do you check for things, right? So. I usually will do a renal bladder ultrasound every year or so, if somebody, especially if somebody has an upper motor neuron bladder. You can see your dynamics doesn't have, right? It's just kind of like when you think somebody needs based on your clinical exam. Cystoscopy, primarily, that's primarily for people that have indwelling catheters, cystoscopy and cytology. So those are every five years. All right, that's what I got. I know there was a lot of Spanish, like upfront Spanish, but... Um, I didn't want to get too technical with all the Spanish terms. I can go back to any of those slides if we want to review that stuff or if there are questions. No, that was great. Thank you so much, Dr. Escalon. Um, we have a few minutes until um, it's, you know, the time is up, but feel free to ask any um, questions that you have. Any words you want to know? Oh, is there something in the chat? Does Botox that is used in the bladder have the same span as Botox used? Um, it depends. I've had patients say that the 
bladder Botox lasts a bit longer, I would say my expectation of the Botox in the bladder is that it'll last longer than the Botox that you might use to treat spasms in like an arm or leg. Um, so I usually assume it should last about six months, but for some people it lasts three or they last a little less over time when they like on um, repeat treatments. Quick question, Dr. Escalon. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I was wondering if you had any tips for some of our members who are beginners and recently decided to pick up a new language and wanting to learn Spanish uh, and medical Spanish and PMNR specifically. Do you have any tips or tricks to kind of help them along their journey? Um, I would say don't be shy. A lot of people are shy and they don't try to speak. speak i don't think that you can learn to speak without trying to speak it's like anything else you know you're not gonna learn to play basketball if you don't shoot the ball no matter how much you conceptualize the shot in your brain so um i think that's important it's okay to start with words it's okay to start with even like spanglish and mixing the words in if you have a patient that understands both um i would also say know your limitations uh If you can only have like a couple words, um, it's still important then to loop in the interpreter when you've gotten everything that you can, because ultimately you can't forget about the patient. So it's very tempting to say like, come in and say, dolor, no, uh, comer, yeah, uh, orina, yeah, poo -poo. yeah. And you're like, okay, my patient's fine and then walk out. Uh, so don't do that. You still have to do like your full history, but even starting there is good, but then build on that. So get what you can and then te you can test it against the interpreter or if you have someone on your team that speaks Spanish. There are medical Spanish books. There's certainly organizations like this one. And in lectures like this, don't be shy if you have actual questions about different words to use when. Um, because you're not going to learn otherwise. I think um, we live in a day and age, though, that we're lucky to have the interpreters with us. A lot. Uh, oh, so we got a question. How do you say you're having, are you having accidents? So, uh, accidentes is accidents. So you can say accidentes de orina, accidents of urine. You can say accidentes de, and then you can say poo poo. People understand that. Or you can say the more like doctor way of saying poop is bowel movement, which would be movimiento intestinal. intestinal movements so you can say or you can just say accidentes most people understand that to be like bowel or bladder but then you might get a more general answer and if you don't can't pick up what they're saying then you don't know if they're talking about pee or poop so you can say pee pee poo poo like all that is like translates so you don't even have to remember orina necessarily i think we might have time for one more question But if not, before you head out, please fill out the um, Google form that I put in the chat. Thanks so much. Anybody do anything fun this weekend? You guys are quiet. What do you got, Herman? You going to the club again? You know it. That's right. You better invite me this time. I can't have you show me up at the club. That's not... <laughs> one time was one too many for you. <laughs> exactly. I'm going to the ballet tonight. Very nice. The, the, the New York City Ballet, yeah. Very good. They have a deal. This this is good to know. They have a deal. If you're under 30, you can get $30 tickets. Oh. You pay your age? So, <laughs> I uh, 30 is the flat line, I wish. <laughs> do they check your ID? They do, so that you can oh, only get the ticket at the box office. I know. You 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 would probably pass out dress plan. I put a little makeup on, I'll make it through. <laughs> All right. I'm on call, so that'll be fun. Alrighty, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much, Dr. Escalon, again, for your time. We really appreciate it. My pleasure.
Bye, everyone. Disfruten el fin de semana. Bye, everyone.